Okay. 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 It's the AMT Lecture Series. Welcome back for Chapter 3. Apologize in advance for my voice. Um, but I want to get this out there so that you can study for the exam. Hopefully you can make it out. Um, and if it sounds really bad, I'll put a new video up uh, to replace these. But you'll at least have something to go by. All right, today, uh, chapter three, medical legal, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about let's see, I'm not sure this is the slide I want up. Hang on one second. Yeah, all right, so we're going to talk about the basic principle really of of mercy care is to do no further harm. So providing competent, I don't want us to ignore these words, competent. What does competent mean? It means to be able to make a rational decision about people, uh, about people and their well-being. So that's what competent means. But what about this, providing competent emergency care that conforms to the Standard of care. What does standard of care mean? And that's a written, ex accepted levels of emergency medical care expected by reason of training and professionalism. It also can mean written written by legal or professional organizations so that patients are not exposed to unreasonable risk or harm. So that's the stuff we're going to talk about today. But when you're reading something like this, don't skip over these two words because these two words mean everything. And I think if you saw the last the last uh, video lecture about David Rosenbaum, a lot of this will point out to that lecture. All right, so what about ethical? What about ethical? What does ethical mean? And that's the philosophy of right and wrong or moral obliga obligation or duty. It's an ideal professional behavior. All right, so let's look at this scope of practice. We know from the last video that I don't think anybody understood their scope of practice, and that was a problem. The scope of practice. We need to understand this. It's, oh man, sorry. All right, it's, hang on, hang on a second, guys. The pen is not cooperating with me. One second. <clears throat> sorry. 
excuse me. I'll try not to do that too much. All right, it's uh, the scope of practice is to find by the state. <laughs> that pen is awful. Oh my God. I believe it's that bad. Try it again. <clears throat> don't let me, I don't know. So it's defined by the state. What's that mean? So the state adopts the national standard. They can adopt some of it or all of it. And that's why they, the state gets to outline the standards of care, meaning uh, the ability for the AEMT to use advanced airways that's decided by the state. All right, let's keep moving along. All right, so it's your medical director. Remember, they get to either reduce that and say, you know, we're not doing that at this time, but they can't add to the standard of care. Here's a word, too, that we need to understand. Negligence. All right, so negligence. It's a failure to provide care that a similar trained licensed provider would have provided. Okay, so anytime you're accused of negligence, you're going to have other providers, just like in the Rosenbaum incident, looking at this. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, the scope of practice, it's different from the standard of care, right? Man, I wish I'd I didn't know it was going to be this bad. <laughs> I can't even draw on it. All right, so um, the deal is, think about this. Think about it's a certain area of the certain scope that you're allowed to do, right? It's still all right, so all right, so think about this as like a light, okay, so. Anything outside of what this is focusing on is outside of your scope. And remember that scope of the uh, the standard. That's that's what these are procedures that you can do. 
all right, that's your within your scope of practice. That standard of care is completely different. Standard of care is determined by other people that are that are that hold your current certification. Okay. Um it's going to be determined by your experience level. So not only will it be, it'll be someone of your similar experience. It's as a paramedic for over 20 years, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to do something different than a paramedic that's been out there for one week. Okay, so that standard of care will be different. Um, the standard of care will be determined by your textbook that you were trained in. We're going to look at your SOGs. We're going to look at the protocols. All of these stack up under standard of care. All right, but scope of practice is the your your procedures that you do. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So on the Rosenbaum incident, they were looking at all of that. So the, the standard of care is a manner in which you are required to act or behave while providing emergency care. Okay, so established by so some professional organizations that they'll look at well obviously they're going to look at national registry of EMTs they're also going to look at the national EMS educators it's another group um, a professional organization that represents educators like me and EMS. All right, so they're gonna they're gonna consult with people like that to come in and help the investigation. And you know they did with the Rosa Rosa Mom incident. They had a whole team of folks looking at that stuff. All right, so um, the standards of care continued here. And they talk about this Medical Practices Act. And as it, as it deals with certification and licensure, we do not fall under any certain acts. That was changed when Georgia adopted the National Registry of EMT as their certifying component. We did used to fall under this though. And it was the composite you know, state board. Of medical examiners. And we used to, paramedics used to fall under that, and we no longer do. Big deal there.
So let's talk about negligence. And let's talk about what goes on with this, okay? <clears throat> so we already talked about failure to provide the same care that someone similarly trained would do. Gross negligence. Okay, this can uh, that can that's going to be something that's done willfully or recklessly in a total disregard for duty. And there's three categories. There's malfe uh, malfeasus. Okay. And that's when you act outside of your scope of practice. Okay, then there's non non feces can't pronounce it. I could probably pronounce it if I could talk. All right. And this is when you fail to perform an act that you're required to or you're expected to perform so that you either you fail okay um you fail to perform an act that that they that would be expected let me give you I'll give you an example So let's say you had a patient inside the hospital who was having a allergic reaction and their airway was closing off and an anesthesiologist was called down to the ER to assist with this because more than likely the patient's going to require a trach. So that's a procedure where they're going to make a, a, um, a cut onto the neck and go in to the trachea that way. Just, so let's say this anesthesiologist comes down to do this. And they don't do it. They don't do it because maybe, for whatever reason, they're, they haven't done it before. They're scared to do it. They don't feel competent to do it. Now, with that person's training and their license, this is something they totally should be able to do. But if they fail to perform that act, and under their medical license, it's expected for this for this level of prof, uh, professional to do. They fail to perform it. That's when you would get that. And then there's this one right here. Resapa la quater. It says means the things the thing speak for itself that's when when you can say it only could have happened due to negligence so this person is alert oriented times three have no problems at all maybe they're there for to receive an immunization of some kind and instead of getting the immunization they get another drug and they go into cardiac arrest. I mean, it's, you know, that was only going to happen through that act. You gotta have all four of those elements. All right, they must be present for negligence to apply. If you can't prove all four, you can forget it. Okay.
Let's talk about abandonment. So you're transporting a stable patient and you're flagged down by bystanders. Okay, they point to a parking lot and tell you that someone needs medical care. If you leave your patient to go see about that other patient, that's abandonment. The appropriate thing to do is to call radio and tell them to send another unit. Um, I'll give you another example. Back a long time ago, it was not uncommon for us to go inside to the ER and drop off and tell the and tell the hey we'll be back you know we got another call holding you know and just leave um if you give that hey you know tell that to somebody else other than the nurse and you don't give a proper report that can be considered abandonment So abandonment can take place at a scene of a call or if you don't give proper report inside an emergency department. Now I will tell you this, don't be held hostage for a signature. If they're messing with you like that, you know, I, I will attempt to give them a verbal report that's proper. If they're trying to act like that, they can hold me hostage. Uh, I'll document they refused it. When that patient comes into the ER, it's, you know, you never have a problem getting someone from registration over there, do you? You never will. And they'll get there quickly to get their information, and they are time stamped in that department. There is a certain time where that's appropriate to receive report if they exceed that then that's on them okay so assault so that's threatening someone so if you <coughs> excuse me if you stated that hey um if you don't be quiet, stop being combative. I'm going to put a 14 gauge in your AC. That's a form of of a, that's that's a that's a form of assault. We have to be careful what we say. All right, defamation, slander, and libel. I would encourage you to only document objective findings. The smell of ETOH, you can document their behavior. That's, that's appropriate, but it's not appropriate to put other things in there that would suggest a person was intoxicated or drunk because we can't you know we can't make those determinations because we can't take their blood and run a blood alcohol test and they will drill you on that they'll ask you about all your training that you've had in that area to determine such a thing and so if you're documenting someone's behavior that's observed then you'll be okay. I'm going to remind you about the Good Samaritan Law. It only protects you when you're off duty and doing something in good faith. And I would still be careful with a medical license, um, even off duty. I'm just saying. 
if you don't have a medical license, it's a no-brainer. But if you hold a medical license, it being off-duty, I'm not quite sure that that's going to be good enough to protect you. But what does help us a lot is sovereign immunity because we work for a county government and, and that goes a long ways for us. Um, sovereign immunity would not protect like a private service like AMR. But it does help to protect us a little bit. Let's talk about implied consent. Remember, this is someone who is unconscious or unresponsive. And they're not capable of making a decision, an informed decision. We can treat those patients under implied consent. This also applies to seriously injured children with no parents. They fall under implied consent. And by this one, it's kind of looking okay. This time, just reviewing some of the stuff that I haven't seen in a while. I need to be refreshed on. I'm going to go down to advanced directives now. Before I do that, <clears throat> just be careful when we talk about restraints. Um, I want to just talk about this for a second. If you're transporting a patient, law enforcement has handcuffs on. Unless if they refuse to remove them so that you can put soft restraints on, if the patient needs that, and they refuse to do that, then they need to be riding with you, and they need to, and you need to document that you wanted that to be done but law enforcement refused for the simple reason if you have an accident and that police officer is unconscious or whatever you know he's the only one with a key and so if they're so violent enough to where they need to have handcuffs on this should be a police transport um so that's the normal choice I give them. Um, either you can remove them or you can transport them yourself um, for that reason. Uh, the other thing is you need to document the reasons that you're using these restraints, soft restraints, whatever. Because there's a big movement, I know inside the ER even, you have to contact contact the nursing supervisor if you need restraints and they bring them to you now they're just not readily available um so just be aware of that and there's there's been plenty of times i've used them and i encourage you to use them if you need them but i encourage you to document every reason why you need them Oh man, let me get this too. Um, <clears throat> all right, so everybody needs to understand that if someone is alert and oriented times three with appropriate blood pressure and pulse, they are allowed to refuse treatment and transport. 
because it all comes down to are they able to make a, a, a good informed decision and I say blood pressure because if it's less than 90 systolic and even though they're alert and oriented times three we have to start thinking about perfusion to the brain and that decision needs to be made by medical control but it's definitely something to think about so um and always make sure that you advise them of their risk and consequences of not going to the hospital and please don't misunderstand me if there are if you can't come up with risk and consequences for this call then don't make them up <clears throat> because that's as bad as, as anything else I mean there are crazy events that happen where the patient has a cut on their arm you bandage them up and you say hey you know this is going to need stitches you got five hours if you had not had a tetanus shot you need to get one of them there aren't there at that time there are no risk of that patient not coming with you other than infection but if they take care of that like you've told them to do there there, there are none um and then let's say you leave the patient you know has a you know has an mi or something like that well if you had written this patient care report with these risks and consequences they're going to want to know why why you wrote these risks and consequences on a laceration to the to the finger and they're going to want to know did you know something on the scene did you feel like the patient was going to have an mi you know and so they can take you down a different road so only do what you feel that you've been trained to do only can provide that information only All right, so advanced directives. So a valid DNR must clearly state the patient's medical condition. And it must say a few other things. But, but a valid DNR must clearly state the patient's medical condition. All right, when we talk about confidentiality, there's certain things that aren't confidential, like the time of dispatch. That's a public record. That's not confidential at all. So just remember that. And the last slide for us to go over today will be about organ donors. All right, we organ donors are handled by the hospital, LifeLink, and all that. That's the organization that does that. We're going to treat by our protocols. Okay, that's what we're going to treat by. Being an organ donor doesn't even come into play for us. So our medical director puts in something for organ donor patients then we're going to just treat everybody the way we treat them that also means like holistic care we don't provide holistic care i don't care if it's something out there that everybody's doing that's working we don't do it same reason why we don't give aspirin to somebody who you know who has a headache because we don't have a protocol for that and so that's the reason why we don't do it. But we would do it if our medical director puts something in the protocols for us to do it. Okay, that's it, guys.
probably going to have a couple more lectures of with me in this voice. Uh, but we'll see you next chapter.